Quantum computing is, is interesting to me because it is the, again, governed by the ultimate laws of physics as we know them. So it does tell you what the ultimate limit of computational power is. The most fundamental difference between a quantum computer and a classical computer is uh, really based on this idea of superposition. A classical bit can be either on or off. In a quantum computer, you have those same two states, but the fundamental difference is those qubits instead of bits can be in both the zero state and the one state, or the on state and the off state simultaneously. We're very focused on the, the control aspect of these qubits, developing our custom hardware, our custom compilers. We have a special element that we have access to in these devices called a Joseph's injunction. The Joseph's injunction allows you to build a circuit uh, where the energy levels are not equally spaced. It looks very much like the standard computer chip that you'd buy. We mount them in our dilution refrigerators, which cool them down to approximately 10 millikelvin, where there's no extra excitations in the system current computers throw away a lot of information and a lot of uh, power that we know is there in nature. If we build quantum computers, we're essentially taking advantage of all the power and all the information that we know is in natural systems. The promise of the technology is incredible. Uh, it's something where effectively you create a game-changing technology that does not exist now. You could design new materials. You could apply a quantum simulation to uh, to biological systems or, or chemical systems. Computers are never good enough. We're always trying to build them faster. We're always trying to build them better. There's just certain things that a quantum computer can do that, in a practical sense, a classical computer is not. Quantum computing, what is it? Uh, what can it do to help us understand a little bit more? Are two scientists working at Raytheon that can help us understand uh, not just the computing elements of it, but also kind of the longer range wider implications of what quantum mechanics and quantum computing can do. All right, so joining us now, uh, John Habif, he's a senior scientist at Raytheon, and Zach Dutton, he's the manager of Quantum Information Processing Group. So both of you are doctors, both of you are PhDs, but remember, the rest of us are not. So John, let me ask you first, um, what is quantum computing? Quantum computing is a fundamentally different paradigm in um, information processing than classical computing. Whereas classical computing uses switches that are traditionally made out of um, transistors, um, things that are in, in an on and off state, quantum computing takes advantage of the very rich information that can be capitalized upon in quantum states, which um, are fundamentally uh, made up of superpositions of these transistor states. So whereas a transistor can be in an on and off state, uh, a quantum bit or a qubit can be in a superposition of the on and off state. And a, a much richer variety of information can be stored in those quantum bits. And a much richer computation can be performed with an array of those quantum bits. Dr. Dutton, there was a, a significant amount of jargon there about superpositions and quantum bits. But when you say something can be both on and off at the same time, how does that work? Interestingly, you know, scientists that are working in the field, I think, are developing an intuition surrounding it, but it's not something that's based on something that you see physically. It's based on the results that we see in our experiment. The experiments very clearly show the effects of these superpositions, and it's really that you have a, uh, an object that's in two different very distinct states simultaneously. Transistors or microprocessors work now with ones and zeros, those sort of on and off gates that send information back and forth that we take for granted. So what happens when you can be at one and zero at the same time? As opposed to just being able to process information faster, quantum computers fundamentally process information in a different way. And in fact, you can store an exponential amount of data into a set of qubits, whereas the, the same number of classical bits, the same number of transistors, would only be able to store a linear or, or a relatively small amount of data. So it's really the data storage capacity that's vastly improved, and that lets you process that much more information at the same time. Does that mean uh, terabytes or gigabytes or teraflops of storage space into something very tiny? A lot more classical information bits 
can be stored into a set of quantum bits. Let's say you build one of these computers that are running on qubits. Um, and if it can process enormous amounts of information simultaneously, does that mean that it can pick locks better than what we can do today? Probably the most famous algorithm in quantum mechanics, in quantum computing to date, is Shor's algorithm. And it can specifically, it can factor uh, large numbers into its prime components very efficiently. And most uh, of classical public cryptography on the internet is based on the fact that factoring these large numbers is extremely difficult, uh, nearly impossible for classical computers to do. And so a quantum computer could indeed um, uh, pick locks, like you're saying, uh, much more efficiently. Does that mean also that it can create locks more efficiently? If you can use all of that power to run an algorithm and have this massive computation happen, couldn't you use it for good as well? That's a very interesting point. The, uh, there's a, another area of research within the community of quantum information known as quantum key distribution or quantum cryptography. And uh, in those areas of research, they use the same principles, the quantum uncertainty principle and the um, unique properties of quantum entanglement to allow two people to share random bit streams that can be used as keys to lock data. And that sharing has been shown to be impervious to attacks that uh, might be uh, rendered with a quantum computer or any other types of attacks. So uh, that's, a, that's an interesting dichotomy in the, in the research field. Another uh, element of quantum research that I think I'm a little curious about was this idea of quantum entanglement and teleporting information from one place to another without it ever having traveled through the spaces in between. That's kind of straight out of Star Trek. How does that happen? Now, when two particles are entangled, if you make a measurement on one of them, you alter that particle, but you actually alter the state of the other particle as well. And that's something that's purely quantum mechanical and there's no analog in classical physics at all. Um, one um, misunderstanding often is that quantum entanglement or teleportation can result in communication that's faster than the speed of light or instantaneous. And that's not quite true because the measurement of these quantum particles is random. And so, so you can't communicate faster than the speed of light. How do you see the work that you're doing now impacting society 10 years from now, 20 years from now? If you take uh, say, chemistry or material science. These are sciences where you're trying to understand and engineer um, new materials or new uh, chemicals, um, and it's impossible to really do that efficiently with the, but with the models that we can do on classical computers. What we can do with a quantum computer is essentially simulate that naturally and therefore compute the properties of these very complex many particle systems very efficiently and so it will be a, a huge tool uh, to people working in these kinds of difficult modeling tasks. John? So if you take a, a powerful classical computer now there are a subset of functions that that classical computer needs to perform. Could we replace maybe one of those sub-functions with a small quantum processor that would yield some really improved functionality. Um, uh, the, same, the same notion in quantum networks, right? We have very powerful quantum network. We have very po powerful classical networks. Is there some small functionality that could drastically improve those networks by understanding quantum mechanics, understanding how quantum information could impact just aspects of the network rather than in, rather than replacing the entire network? Okay, Dr. John Habeff, Dr. Zach Dutton from Raytheon, thanks so much for this primer on quantum everything. Thank you.